Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. I'm currently teaching a topology class, and the other day in class, we looked at a pretty interesting example, and I thought I'd make a video about it. And so it has to do with this topological idea of path connectedness. So let's quickly look at the definition. So we say a set X, really it's a topological space, but we won't be super careful about that. So we say X is path connected if for every X and Y in X, there's a continuous function from the unit interval to the set X so that F of zero is X and F of one is Y. So the picture is like this. So say this is our space X right here and notice it's got some holes in it. That's totally okay. And then here's my little point X here and my little point Y here. And a path can be thought of as like a curve in your space. And in fact, that's kind of what a continuous function is doing. It's taking the unit interval and it's twisting it up into a curve in whatever space you're working in. And so notice that this is path connected because, well, I've got this path from X to Y. And X and Y here are playing the role of like arbitrary points. You can kind of see just by the shape of this space that if I take any two points here, I can find paths between them. For instance, if I take a point right here, I won't name it, and then maybe a point right here, I can for sure find a path between these two points. I can in fact find a bunch of paths, but maybe a kind of interesting path would go like this. Maybe it would loop around this like little hole and then maybe go into the point over here. Okay, so anyway, I think now we've got some sort of idea of what it means for a space to be path connected. If you're the kind of person that likes solving puzzles for fun, or if watching this channel means you're already deep into math, science, or logic, then you need to check out Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform built for people who actually enjoy thinking. It's not about passively watching videos or memorizing formulas. Instead, you do math, science, computer science through hands-on, bite-sized lessons that actually make you feel smarter. What I love is that Brilliant doesn't just teach you what to think, it teaches you how to think. It's like your brain gets a workout, and somehow it's fun. You can dive into topics like their updated science courses. They help you make sense of our universe at every level from the mechanics of simple machines all the way to the mind-bending physics of black holes. Learn to think like an engineer as you design electric circuits, gear systems, and stable bridges. Develop your scientific intuition through visual, interactive problem solving that gets you hands-on with key concepts. Try everything Brilliant has to offer for free. Scan the QR code on screen or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. So if you take R squared, so in other words, the plane, and you take away all of the points where both coordinates are rational, then you still get something that's path connected. Now, until you see how this works, this seems like a kind of a crazy result, but then after you see how the proof goes, you'll see that it isn't really that crazy of a result. Now, why does it seem like a crazy result, you might say? Well, Q squared is dense in R squared. And so by dense, we mean that like, if you go between any two points from Q squared, no matter how close they are, there's gonna be a point that is outside of Q squared. Another way of thinking about it is like, if you form the, whatever the closure is of Q squared, you get R squared. So anyway, I've made a mock-up of what this picture might be. So all of those dots there are in Q squared. So you can think about those as being removed and R squared minus Q squared would be everything left, left over. And so our eyes can't really resolve the distance between all rational points and maybe non-rational points or just real valued points. And so this is just a way of like thinking about it. Okay, so how is this gonna go? Well, let's do it in kind of a step-by-step -step way. So let's take any two points, X and Y, where the coordinates are irrational. So that means that they're of the form, 
you know, A comma B, C comma D, if you will, where A, B, C, and D are all irrational numbers. So it's an R squared minus Q. So let's maybe go ahead and write those two points over here. So perhaps this would be our point X, and perhaps, you know, for the sake of argument, this over here would be our point Y. Okay, so that's the first step. Now we somehow want to construct a path between X and Y that never goes through a point with rational coordinates. So let's see how we can do this. I think there's a bunch of ways to do this, but here's a pretty straightforward way and it's very constructive. Okay, so let's let L be the perpendicular bisector of X and Y. So let's get that sketched at least a little bit over here. So what's the perpendicular bisector? Well, it's the unique line that goes through the midpoint of X and Y and is perpendicular to the line containing X and Y. So let's see, something right in the middle of X and Y is perhaps this right here. And then perpendicular to the line through X and Y would be something like this. So this would be our point L. And so this is gonna contain points with rational coordinates and points with irrational coordinates. Well, I guess maybe as we'll see, it's not guaranteed to um, contain points with rational coordinates, but it could contain both types of points. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is, for every point on this line, we're gonna construct um, a union of line segments from X to that point, and then from that point to Y. So let's talk through that here. So for every Z in L, let's consider the following curve, which is defined by this function F, which is going from zero, one into just the plane, R squared. And that function is gonna be defined like this. So I'm gonna put F sub Z here because it's gonna depend on this Z. And then we'll write it as a function of T. And it's gonna be a piecewise function. And this is kind of like a very, very explicit way to do this. You could do this like a little more hand wavy if you wanted to, and it would be essentially just as good. But anyway, let's see. This is gonna be one minus two T times our coordinate X plus two T times our coordinate Z. And this is if T is on the interval from zero to one half. And then let's see, it's gonna be two minus two T times the coordinate Z and then plus two T minus one times the coordinate Y if T is on the coordinate or on the interval from one half to one. And so now I'd like to observe that if I plug T equals one half into this upper definition of our function and this lower definition of the function, I get Z in both cases. That's because T equals half will zero out this term and it'll just leave this with Z it'll zero at this term and leave us with Z as well. So since at the place where these two components of our function overlap, they're equal, that means we have a continuous function. And that, if you're taking a topology class, is sometimes called the gluing lemma for what it's worth. Okay, cool. So let's see what we've done here. So let's say that this right here, for instance, is our point Z. So let's maybe get that in a different color. Maybe that's gonna be in blue here. So this blue point right here is our point Z. And then our function F is essentially making a, what is it? A union of line segments from X to Z and then from Z to Y. And just, you know, for the sake of argument, let's point out that our function evaluated at zero will most definitely be X. Well, that's because if we evaluate this at zero, we use this definition up here, that's gonna zero out the Z part and just give us X, so that works. And then our function evaluated at one half by construction will be this point Z right here. And then again, by construction, our function evaluated at one 
will be uh, on y. Now, this is most definitely a path from x to y in R2 for all z in L. The problem here is that if we pick z in a maybe unlucky way, we may go through a point with rational coordinates. So how can we argue that there's most definitely a way to pick this z so that we don't go through points with rational coordinates? Well, here's how that goes. So let's notice that since our line L is essentially the same as the real number line. So I'll just put that here, maybe in a topological sense, we would call this homeomorphic. But well, why is that? Well, this line right here can be thought of just as a copy of the real line, just smashed into the real plane on a tilt like that, if you will. But that means that L has uncountably many points. But if L itself has uncountably many points, then that means that there are uncountably many FZ paths from X to Y. And another thing to point out is that they only intersect at X and Y. I think that's pretty clear because notice if we pick another point right down here, for instance, that's gonna go here and here, it's only gonna, intersect you know our original path at x and y that that's going to be true for all of these if you pick a different z value but well notice that q squared is a countable set so since it's a countable set it should be possible to pick a z so that this path doesn't contain anything from q squared now, how could we maybe write that down a little bit more carefully? Well, we could do it like maybe by way of contradiction. So if every FZ path, every FZ path, so we'll just consider, FZ is the function, but we'll like write FZ path for the actual path there. So if every FZ path contains a point from Q squared, in other words, a point where both coordinates are rational, then we have a one-to-one -one or an injective map, which starts at R and then it's sent into L via this maybe way of thinking about L as essentially equal to R. And then this is injected into Q squared. And well, what's the map from L to Q squared? Well, it's just the choice of whatever point that we found from Q squared into L. But now that's a problem because we've got this injective map that starts at R and ends at Q squared. But that means the cardinality of R is less than or equal to the cardinality of Q squared. But of course we know Q squared is countable, whereas R is uncountable. So that's our contradiction. And so what does that contradiction gives us, give us? Well, that means that this is false right here. In other words, there exists an FZ path that does not contain any point from Q squared. But if it doesn't contain any point from Q squared, then it lies completely in R squared minus Q squared. But that gives us our path completely contained in R squared minus Q squared from any point of R squared minus Q squared to any other point. But that's exactly what we need for this space to be path connected. And that's a good place to stop.